Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us. My name is Caitlin. I'm the programs coordinator at Urban Green Council. Um, just as a quick introduction before we get started today, um, that and I can see we're still waiting on a couple more people to join us. But um, if you're going to ask any questions during today's session, we just ask that you put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or it might be at the top if you're in full screen mode. Um, that'll just make it easiest for um, Kara to go through and see questions as they come in, um, rather than putting it in both the Q&A and the chat. If you have any uh, other technical issues, you can feel free to email me at kl at urbangreencouncil.org and I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, but that is it for me. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kara now from Sims Municipal Recycling to tell us a little bit more. Great. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Caitlin. Thanks for being here, everyone. Happy to be with you. My name is Karen Napolitano. Uh, and I'm going to take us on a virtual tour today through Sims Municipal Recycling, explain how our facility operates, how recycling works in New York City, and really how recycling works in general. So please, I do welcome your questions throughout. Um, if you ask a question that I'm going to answer you know, later on in the uh, presentation, that's why I'm skipping it over, but all other questions I, I very much uh, will make it a point to address. So ask away. Uh, so let me share my screen and show you Sims Municipal Recycling. So I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for uh, this company and this facility. We are located on an 11 acre pier in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. So right on the waterfront, really spectacular views of the Upper Bay and downtown Brooklyn, downtown Manhattan, Staten Island, Jersey City. Um, it is a recycling facility, but it's rather a beautiful place and a beautiful spot to, and not a bad place to work when I actually could go into the office that is. Um, but a couple of things you can see uh, from this vantage point, you can see our solar panels. So we have one of Brooklyn's largest solar arrays and that solar array can power up to 12 and a half percent of our facility. Uh, and then of course we have the wind turbine as well, which you can also see here. The turbine uh, will power, can power up to about two and a half percent of our facility. So on the sunniest, windiest day, uh, we can be up to 15 percent power by renewable energy. So Sims Municipal Recycling, that is our company name, but the type of facility we are is a material recovery facility. Um, maybe some of you have heard of a MRF, maybe all of you have, maybe none of you have, uh, but just to get us all on the same page, a material recovery facility, a MRF, is essentially a sorting facility for recyclables. Uh, here's another lovely photo of our facility uh, from the waterfront this time. So you can see some of the greenery around our facility. We actually have some bioswales as well um, for capturing rainwater uh, and filtering rainwater around the property. Um, but a MRF is actually quite a common type of facility because you know, think of the way that we recycle. We mix different types of materials into one bin. At least that's how we do it in, in this country primarily. So the purpose of the MRF is to then sort out those different types of materials so that they are actually valuable and can be sold and reprocessed. So this MRF, again, located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and this is actually one of our bioswales. You can sort of see uh, the depression in the earth there. That's one, one of our larger, uh, more prominent ones. But our job is to receive, sort, and then sell New York City's recyclables. So just a couple of things that I like to make clear about that. First, um, we only receive recyclables. So we're not receiving trash. Anything that was put into a trash bin or you know, left out for collection in a black bag will not come to us, even if it is a recyclable. The second thing I like to make clear is that we are only receiving recyclables from homes and public schools. So only what the city collects. And in New York City, the city or our you know, municipal uh, sanitation program, they do not collect from commercial establishments. So businesses, restaurants, stores, office buildings and the like, they have to hire what's called a private carter or private hauler to uh, collect their waste and recyclables. Those recyclables go on a journey similar to what I will take you through today, but not through Sims Municipal Recycling. 
Even so, even though we are only receiving from homes and public schools, we are still receiving about a thousand tons of materials each day, which is a lot as far as MRFs go. And that actually makes us the largest MRF in the country by volume. So another neat aerial of our facility here, you can see the full pier, you can see the solar panels and the wind turbine again. You can again see one of our bios whales here. We also have a much longer, larger one. I think this is when they were still installing some of the greenery. So shortly after we opened, this was taken, but uh, another T-shaped bioswale here on the other side of the pier as well. So another thing you can see from this photo, uh, of course, the large buildings as well, I'll show you what happens inside of them, but also you can see the barges that are tied up along the side of the pier. So this is a main way that we receive materials and that materials will go outbound from our facility as well. So barge access is a reason that we selected this waterfront location. So we are right here in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Very accessible to the waterfront, of course, but not exactly as the most central location in the city, right? We're not that close to the Bronx. We're not that close to upper Manhattan and Queens. So to avoid collection trucks having to drive recyclables all the way to us in Sunset Park from all over New York City, we have two transfer stations, one in Hunts Point, the Bronx, one in Long Island City, Queens, where collection trucks consolidate. They unload their recyclables recyclables are loaded onto a barge. We can fit about a hundred truckloads on one barge and the barge continues down the orange line to us in Sunset Park. This blue dot over here is actually another MRF operated by Sims. It's much smaller than our Brooklyn facility. It's been around a bit longer. That is where Staten Island's recyclables go and some of lower Manhattan. So it's still Sims, just a slightly smaller, uh, well, significantly smaller, I would even say, uh, in Jersey City location. So that's a little intro to who we are and how we operate at Sims Municipal Recycling. But now sort of expanding the picture and looking at the full recycling process, just to see where the MRF fits into that process and who the other players are. So I'll start with a MRF. I've already mentioned we are a sorting facility for recyclables. The MRF, once the materials have been sorted out into their respective categories, the MRF will sell those materials to the appropriate reprocessor. Metals go to a smelter, plastics go to a plastic reclaimer, paper goes to a mill, and so on Which e with each of the materials. And that red dot, that's really where the materials are prepared to be whatever they will be next. That's not necessarily where they're completely manufactured into another product or package. So the reprocessing phase, they will prepare the materials to be something new and then sell them to a brand or a manufacturer. And that is an incredibly important step that we as recyclers, right? As people putting recyclables in a bin, we don't always think about. Everything we put in that bin needs to be bought by someone and used in their products or packaging for it to truly be recycled and recyclable. Um, so again, very important step, brand or manufacturer must buy the recycled material, use it in their products or packaging, and then sell them back to the consumer who hopefully has the ability to recycle that item once again, at which point it will be collected by whoever's job it is to pick up your waste. It might be your municipality, it might be a private hauler, uh, that's just going to depend on where you are and how uh, you know waste management is, is set up and organized in that location. But the hauler will then bring your recyclables back to a MRF and the journey continues. And that's it if all goes well and there are no you know, major speed bumps or barriers. Of course, there are many potential barriers uh, in this system. Uh, but again, if, uh, if all goes well and if you have a highly recyclable item, it should move through this process. All right, I will get to that, don't worry. You see the question. So at 
Sims, we receive New York City's recycling. So what is accepted in New York City's recycling program? Uh, I will focus on New York City in this section. This also, this tends to be a hot slide with a lot of questions. So you're welcome to just send them in. Um, needs and capabilities. So recycling program. Oh, sorry, I might freeze. <laughs> it said my internet connection is unstable. So you did freeze for a second there, Kara. I don't know if you just want to start at the top of this uh, slide. Okay. Um, so I will say in New York City, we have a dual stream recycling program, meaning residents are to separate recyclables into two bins. There's the blue bin and the green bin. In the blue bin, we accept four types of materials. Metal, anything that is metal, anything that is mostly metal, you may recycle in New York City from a very small bottle cap to a very large refrigerator, anything that is mostly metal. Glass, bottles and jars only, any bottle or jar, any shape, size or color, but only bottles and jars. Because the company's buying the glass from us, they're making bottles and jars. So that's the type of glass they need to put into their furnaces to make their products. So bottles and jars only. Cartons, they go in the blue bin. Please remember, cartons go in the blue bin. And rigid plastic. So any hard plastic, any plastic that keeps its shape if you set it on the counter, right? It's not going to just deflate as a plastic bag would and kind of fall over and not keep any kind of shape. Hard plastic. You don't have to worry about the numbers. Is it number one or number two? Is it a bottle? Is it a jug? That's not how we work in New York City. That's how some programs work. Some programs might say we only want, you know, bottles and jugs, uh, or we only want plastic number one and plastic number two. Uh, but in New York City, we say all rigid plastic. Um, similarly, some programs uh, that accept metal, well, all, all recycling programs are generally going to accept metal, but some programs will say we only want soda cans and tin cans. Uh, those are the most commonly accepted metal items. But in New York City, we'll take all of your metal, please. Glass, bottles, and jars, that's pretty common from program to program. And some recycling programs don't want cartons at all. Um, so if you're not in New York City, do make sure to check and see if your local program accepts cartons. They're just a low value item and they're a very small percentage of our waste stream. So sometimes they're not accepted. That's the blue bin. In the green bin, we put paper and cardboard. If you can rip it, you can recycle it. Um, greasy pizza boxes in New York City are fine. Just be sure to take the pizza out of the box. Uh, the plastic um, windows on those mailing envelopes, those are fine. A little bit of staples, a little bit of tape, it's fine. Uh, of course, anything that's not paper is not really ideal in that stream, but little bits of contaminants that might be hard to remove from the paper in New York City are okay. And then everything else goes in the trash. So it's not, if it's not one of those six items or materials, it is a trash item in New York City. I'm just going to check to see. Yes, ice cream cartons. So ice cream cartons, I'm going to say, are um, they're trash. They're just not made of the same stuff as milk cartons. Some are, but some aren't. So because of that lack of consistency, uh, the, the simplest answer is that ice cream cartons are trash. Um, and then I will get to the, the answer about who purchases our materials towards the end when I get to that step. So compost is not what we are here to talk about, but I do like mentioning it because it is another very large percentage of our waste stream, no matter where you are. In New York City, compostable items, food scraps, food soiled paper, uh, compostable plastics and yard waste makes up about a third of everything we throw away in New York City. So I do like to mention it. 
we had this brown bin program. It was not citywide. It was not mandatory, but the city was starting to, to implement it and build this program for uh, compost or for organic um, recycling. However, because of the pandemic, because of budget strains in the city, and because of low participation rates, unfortunately, in this program, the brown bins, um, and again, this was the program where Department of Sanitation would come to your home if you had this brown bin and collect organics directly from your home that you could leave out in this brown bin. But that program is on pause. It is temporarily temporarily suspended, it is supposed to come back. However, you can still bring certain compostables to drop off points. Uh, many community gardens are still composting right here in New York City. There are some larger operations, some smaller operations. And I really encourage you, if you can compost, again, it's a huge portion of our waste. And if we can start composting um, our food scraps and our food sold paper and our yard waste, we're, we're going to be in, moving in a good direction as far as waste management. It just makes the things we have to throw away, it really reduces the amount of items that, that end up in the trash. So if you are ever confused about what goes in the bins, what is recyclable, what is not, how do I get rid of this thing? Uh, in New York City, you can check nyc.gov slash sanitation. They have a great search bar, how to get rid of. You can just type the thing in and it will tell you how to properly dispose of it. Uh, I really encourage you not to just guess. Uh, know before you throw or when in doubt, find out. If you're not in New York City, your municipality should have a website for waste and recycling. Um, has there been a change in the volume of recyclables during the pandemic? Absolutely. Uh, so, and I'll just click to the next slide because I think it's a nice picture that you can stare at while I, this is a, our facility, this is Sims. So when this pandemic started, you know, think of what happened businesses closed, or rather people were not going into work. Sadly, some businesses did, did close, but people weren't going into work. People were staying home. So all the waste that would be created in these commercial establishments, it wasn't being generated there. It was being generated in the home. So residential waste numbers went up, not just in New York City, but everywhere. Um, so absolutely the amount of recyclables we received went up in, June, July, it went up from about 1,000 tons a day to about 1,400 tons a day. Uh, and we were able to manage it. It was, uh, I think it was adventurous, um, but we did it. And now um, before the snowstorms, it had dropped down to about 1,200 tons a day was um, what we're getting. So still, still more, people are still working from home much more. Um, hopefully that answers your second question as well. More, more people at home uh, and those are your numbers. So after we do our part, after we put the thing in the bin, it travels to Sims and it ends up in this very large building here on the left of your screen. This is our tipping floor. If you remember, this is the very large building that has the solar panels on the roof. Um, so at this point in the tour, if we were at Sims, which I'm, I'm sad we're not, but you're all invited to visit one day when it's safe and when we're able to reopen. At this point in the tour, we would walk from this portion of our facility. Uh, this building holds our visitor center and our education center, which is over here, and our But we would walk across this pedestrian walkway in, oh, I think I froze. No, wait a second. Just for a second that time. Okay, cool. <laughs> my computer tells me it's, it's really interesting. Um, so we would walk across this pedestrian walkway. We would take in a lovely view of downtown Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, this is Jersey City. Again, this is our visitor center and our terrace. This is the Statue of Liberty. She's very small, but you can see her as well. And we would walk into the tipping floor. So I'm actually gonna turn the sound on because it's nice to hear. As you walk across, start to hear what's happening. So you start to hear the faint movement of materials. You start to smell a very unique smell. Uh, many kids say it smells like pickles. And then you see the pile. 
the giant pile of mixed recyclables that have come to us from all over New York. Um, uh, Tatiana, recommendations for recycling um, electronics that have built-in battery. And is there any way to recycle plastic utensils and plastic bags? So electronics um, should not go in your in this recycling bin that uh, that we've discussed, not they should not come to Sims. We actually can accept metal appliances, right? Like the microwave or the refrigerator, as I said, um, and even all plastic um, appliances, but anything that has a rechargeable battery. And I know some appliances are now like smart appliances. So they might have some sort of rechargeable battery or chip or something. And that, unfortunately that's gonna create a little gray area for, for recycling these things. but. For electronics, I would check out the Lower East Side Ecology Center. They're having pop-up events throughout the city where you can take um, electronics for recycling. Um, the city had programs for that as well, and, and it will again, it, it has to, uh, but many of those programs unfortunately have been on pause as well with the pandemic. But look up Lower East Side Ecology Center. Um, rechargeable batteries you should be able to bring back to the store where you purchased the rechargeable batteries or where you can purchase rechargeable batteries uh, and they will recycle them. Um, as far as plastic utensils, technically you can put them in your recycling bin, it's allowed, but they're so small, no one's going to be able to capture them. I'll show you exactly where they fall through the cracks and likely end up as waste. Um, so if you can, refuse the plastic utensils. You know, let's make that the norm as well. No, thank you. I don't need utensils. I'm taking this takeout home <laughs> or I have a fork in my bag. Um, no, no utensils, please. Uh, and plastic bags, you can take back to certain um, retail uh, locations for recycling, like Target, Stop and Shop, Best Buy, I think Home Depot, Walmart. Larger stores such as these will have recycling bags bins, usually somewhere by their entrance, for um, for plastic bags, for soft plastics and plastic bags. Like you can take the single use plastic bag there, you can take like the bread bags, you can even take the mailing envelopes and recycle them uh, at those store drop off locations, um, but just not in your home recycling bin. Is there still a significant market demand for second use plastics and paper? I mean, yeah, we're selling it. Um, absolutely. Uh, the, pay, the value of paper actually has gone up during the pandemic because supply chains have been become a little bit wonky. Um, so uh, paper mills and paper manufacturers have actually come to rely on recycled paper a bit more during the pandemic. Okay, so the pile. So that pile got there uh, either by way of a Department of Sanitation truck or uh, a Sims barge. So if you'll remember, we have those transfer stations where the trucks consolidate and the materials are loaded onto a barge. So the barges travel down the East River, they're pushed by a tugboat and they come to our facility. And then the barges are unloaded by a crane or excavator. Some of them are excavators, I believe. So they are scooping recyclables off the barge, throwing them onto that large pile. And then this front end loader mixed time, uh, and then eventually will push items into the system as you sort of see it doing. <laughs> for a moment because I think I may have froze again. But I just like to turn on the sound there to give you a sense because this is one of the things we would see if we were at the facility. We would stand on an observation platform and look over at this, at this room, at our tipping floor where we receive materials. It's very loud. It is a very stimulating, exciting room for many people. Um, you know, you get to see this again, mountain of mixed materials that is less than half a day of New York City's recycling. But when you look a bit closer, you notice it's actually two piles, right? Because New York City is a dual stream recycling program. Much of the country 
operates single stream recycling programs where the paper would be mixed as residents, we would put everything in one bin. Uh, that just means that, you know, those municipalities are utilizing MRFs that have more technology to sort the paper as well, not just the metal, glass, plastic, and cartons. Um, for us in New York City, we remain dual stream for many reasons. Uh, one reason to contemplate is we would need such a bigger MRF if we were going to sort the paper out as well. We already have the largest MRF in the country just sorting out the metal, glass, plastic, and cartons, which is about a thousand tons a day. Paper recycling in New York City is about another thousand tons a day. Um, so that would really up uh, the size of our facility, the scale of our facility, and um, the technology that we needed in our facility. So we receive at SIMS 100% of New York City's recycled metal, glass, plastic, and cartons, the residential side, of course. And then we receive about half of New York City's recycled paper. And we're sort of a, a transfer facility for that paper. The trucks that have collected paper uh, in Brooklyn, they bring it to us. We consolidate it onto a truck. So larger trucks that we fill with paper and those trucks are going to go to the paper mill that is on Staten Island that receives most of New York City's recycled paper. This paper mill is called Pratt Industries. They pulp New York City's paper in a giant pulper too. It is a huge paper mill, a huge pulper out on Staten Island. This is not the pulper. This is kind of like a, a backup, um, kind of a holding tank for, for some of the pulp. But they turn it into this very icky oatmeal looking mush. Uh, and then it goes through their paper process and they are making giant rolls of paper. And the paper is done. That's the story of paper. Then those rolls will be bought by, you know, paper processors or paper manufacturers to make paper products. But the metal, glass, plastic, and cartons still need sorting. So this is a drawing of the system that we use to sort the metal, glass, plastic, and cartons. You know, people call it a, a Rube Goldberg kind of mousetrap-like Hot Wheels track roller coaster water park looking thing. Um, and it's, of course, it's there to sort our recyclables. So I'm going to take a couple of these questions and then I'll tell you how it works. Um, what if your residential building only has single stream recycling bins? Yeah, there's often one person in a tour who asks about this. So if you live in a residential building in one of the five boroughs in New York City, you really should be separating your recyclables into metal, glass, plastic, and paper. And if you're not, if that's not an option in your building, there's a very good chance your building is recycling wrong, unfortunately, and that your paper might be ending up with us at Sims in this system where it should not be ending up and then might be ending up as waste, unfortunately. That's actually happened a lot more during the pandemic. We've been seeing a lot more paper in the metal glass plastic stream, um, which isn't great. It, uh, again, it often means that that paper gets damaged. It's rubbing up against all the metal glass plastic cartons and all the little bits of food residue in there. And it's becoming dirty and lower quality and harder to sell. Uh, and so again, often we'll, we'll end up as waste. So, there are some apartment buildings that the super might do the sorting for you, um, but that, that's really the exception to the rule. Um, so I would encourage you to maybe approach your super or approach your building manager and let them know, hey, recycling in New York City is the law and here is how it's meant to be done. You can get uh, signage for free from, from the Department of Sanitation, nyc.gov slash sanitation. They have a lot of great resources. They will send you free signs that you can post in your trash room or, or wherever that happens. Okay. And then are there any advantages to dual stream or single stream recycling? Absolutely. Or is it just a different way to achieve the same result? Yeah, it is a different way to achieve the same result, but um, it's going to depend on so many factors. Um, so the advantage, the potential advantage to single stream is simplicity and convenience. Don't we love simplicity and convenience in this country and the kind of in general? Um, there's only one bin. You put it all in one bin. So there's a good chance you're going to recover more recyclables. The downside is it can affect the quality of the paper. You know, in New York City, our metal glass, plastic, and cartons has a fair amount of food residue on it. 
which is okay. We are able to handle that at Sims. We're still able to sort it and sell it, but that could really damage the quality of the paper, right? Paper is a more delicate material. So we might lose the value uh, and the recyclability of, of some of that paper in that case. Um, additionally, you know, in a program or in a city as large as ours, again, single stream would work, would require a lot more technology for sorting. So the city would have to invest more. Um, the MRF would have to invest more potentially. Uh, so potential, you know, for more investment and, and more loss of the paper product. But you know, some smaller communities maybe that are, are better at requiring their residents to clean their recyclables and residents actually do clean their recyclables. Um, they may have more success with single stream. You know, it's something that, you know, a community might have to try out. Like I think Hoboken recently switched from single stream to dual stream because they found that, you know, for whatever reason that worked better for them financially and logistic wise. All right, so I will show you how this system works. So the first, well, actually first, let, let me show you just a couple of things to notice. So it, it's about two and a half miles of conveyor belts total. Um, and one thing you can see from this photo or this picture is that many systems are doubled. So you can see two of the same here and two of the same here and two of the same and two of the same. And that's so if one side breaks down or is jammed up by a material, we can keep running on the other side. Um, so hopefully we can at least run at 50%. Remember, we have a thousand tons a day to sort. Um, we need to keep working at all times. So this is the facility in person. Here's the sound. is operating 24 hours a day, five, sometimes six days a week. It takes about 33 humans to operate this facility during one shift. Of course, you see all the safety posters as well. Safety truly, truly is number one um, for us and in facilities like this in general. So here's how it works. Here are the steps. First step, we need to load the system. We need to get that giant pile into that giant maze of conveyor belts. So the front end loader here, pushes materials in to the entry point right here. Our view is going to flip. And you see after the front end loader pushes materials in, they travel up this conveyor belt here. Some materials fall back. We can see some things falling back down. That's intentional. It keeps from overloading the system. It keeps a steady flow of materials entering the system. I see that question I'll answer it in a moment. So first step after entry is the liberator. Very serious. So our view has flipped once again. You can see there's the entry point there. And here is the liberator. So the liberator is essentially a slow speed shredder that rips open what's popped up here, recycling bags, liberating the contents. In New York City, we use these clear bags for collections. Many recycling programs then other places do not use bags. Many places say, if you leave your recyclables out in a bag, we won't collect them because the bags are kind of a pain to deal with. But in New York City, we just don't have space for large, secure, sealable bins on every corner that can hold all of the recyclables that we leave out for collections. So the bags, it's really a space issue and the, the bags are there to contain the materials so they don't blow into the environment. You know, I even have a bin outside my building but it, sometimes it falls over and the recyclables fall over. So I keep telling my neighbors, please bag your recyclables. I'm tired of them blowing down our street. Um, this is not good practice. Practice. Uh, so that's really the reason for the bags. And it's the reason for the liberator, which we've sort of zoomed in on now. You can see materials fall through onto this bottom conveyor belt and then enter the system for sorting. And I'll pause here and just take a couple of questions. So have we had to change work practices to ensure the staff is safe during COVID-19? Yes, absolutely. You know, we're certainly no stranger to personal protective equipment in a facility like ours, but of course not everyone is wearing masks. Um, in the uh, stations where humans are actually working on the lines, which you'll see in a moment, we have um, 
in some cases, they were already at least six feet apart, but in the cases where they're not, um, we initially only had one person on that line so that we could set up a plastic shield. So there is a shield between the, the two workers if they were closer than six feet. You know, we're staggering start times, staggering break times. Um, there's just six feet signage all over the facility and there's just hand sanitizer. There already was a lot of hand sanitizer around our facility, you can imagine why, um, but now there's even more uh, hand sanitizer available around the facility. So I, and I think those are pretty standard practices that, that many places are, are doing. Okay. Um, how are we handling 12 to 14 times the amount and what are we planning for uh, for more work from home in the future. So um, luckily we have two facilities and luckily we were not at capacity at this facility. So we were able to process the, the increased tonnages. Um, and it, you know, it was 1400 tons for um, it, oh, like a month or something, you know, luckily this is not our first rodeo. <laughs> we know what to do around the holidays when tonnages go up crazy amounts. We know what to do, you know, after snow days when collections don't happen for a few days and then they do and there's a huge influx. So we are used to, um, you know, these, these raises in tonnages. We know how to kind of shuffle things from Brooklyn to Jersey um, and how to, how to make it work. I've already touched on this, but I'm happy to go back. Just to clarify, you are not <laughs> we are not currently hosting any in-person tours. Um, as much as education is such an important part of recycling and Sims is so happy to have our educational program with our interactive recycling museum on site and our observation platforms. Um, and we love hosting visitors. We love showing people what happens normally behind closed doors. We love sharing this process um, with New Yorkers and with everyone. Um, while that's important to us, our main purpose is to process New York City's recyclables. So we need to keep our workers who are doing that as safe as possible. So we really, unfortunately, we can't be in any kind of a hurry to, to welcome visitors back on site. And I really don't have any idea when that'll happen again. I'd like to think sometime in the summer, but last year I also thought maybe it'll happen sometime in the summer. So I really, you know, hopefully with the vaccine coming out, there'll, there'll be a more uh, firm date coming up soon. I do know that I plan to sort of have open house events for everyone who went on virtual tours and didn't get to see it live. So look forward to that and, and do try to visit when, um, when the city begins to reopen more and more. Um, I wanna pause on questions, I'll come back to them, but I wanna show you a little more of the process. So after the liberator, Recyclables have been liberated. Everything passes over disc screens. These metal rods, they spin and recyclables roll over the top. You can see plastic and metal passing over. You can see a lot of plastic bags that should not be there, but are rolling over and maybe getting stuck in the disc screens. Um, but as materials roll over the top, glass hits against those metal rods and breaks into small pieces. And much of it will have already been broken as well. But the glass then falls through openings in between the disc screens. It is screened out from the mix. It drops onto another conveyor belt that brings it out the back. So this is a lovely way of sorting glass out from the mix of materials. It also removes everything that is less than about two inches in two dimensions. All of this material goes to a glass plant, which is sort of like a MRF, remember material recovery facility, that's what we are, sorting facility. The glass plant is like a sorting facility for glass only. So it's going to sort contaminants out of the glass stream. It's going to sort the glass by color. Um, we're able to sort out little pieces of metal with magnets and reverse magnets, but little pieces of plastic like the forks, the straws, um, all other small plastics, they generally end up as waste. This is not something happening at our facility only, this is happening at MRFs in general across the board. Um, so one small thing you can do, uh, leave the plastic caps on the plastic bottles so that they make it through the system. Plastic stays with plastic uh, and that goes, for, that goes for cartons as well. You can leave the plastic cap on. So that is glass. Oh, and I left the, the glass plant on there. That's exciting. So at our glass plant, 
Um, this is a magnet pulling small magnetic metals out of the glass mix. And then an opposite magnet, you can see little bits being repelled. These are little bits of non-magnetic metal being repelled from the glass stream. And then you see the color is mixed here. After we've removed contaminants, you just have different colors of glass that go under a special scanner that can identify the different colors. And then we can sort out only clear from only brown from only green, which raises their value. Most of this clear glass will go to a glass furnace and become another bottle or jar. Oh, I have this in there as well, that's so funny. Um, so Nespresso also, they invested in, uh, in our facility so that in New York City, if you like Nespresso, you can toss your Nespresso pods uh, right into your metal glass plastic bin. They will fall through, end up with our glass, go to our glass plant. Uh, Nespresso helped us invest in a powerful eddy current or reverse magnet to repel the pods out of the glass stream. And then they helped us invest in a special shredder to shred the aluminum pods, remove the coffee grounds, and then recover the aluminum. So it's kind of cool. Nespresso also has a, a take back program where you can send the pods back to them and they recover the metal and I believe the grounds inside as well. And I, <laughs> Nespresso did not pay me. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Uh, how what they've done, how they've worked with us. So um, back at the Brooklyn facility, back at the Brooklyn MRF, after materials pass over the disc screens and the glass is removed, everything passes underneath a drum magnet, a large spinning drum with a powerful magnet inside. You can see the ferrous metals attached to the magnet and drop off onto another conveyor belt. And we've sorted out the ferrous metals. Uh, question about Nespresso, I'll answer that now. Are the Nespresso pods recyclable for commercial hauling in NYC as well? It's uh, maybe, but I, I can't really answer that. Commercial haulers, there are many of them in New York City and they all operate a little bit differently. So just residential is, is what I can say for sure about the Nespresso pods. Just take, take your Nespresso pods home and <laughs> recycle them in your home recycling or send them back. You know, maybe if your business has a, um, has a machine, then you can all collect the pods and then send them back to Nespresso. That would be the best way to do it if you wanted to do it from, from work. Uh, so any materials that are not uh, attracted by that drum magnet, at the end of the line, at the end of the process, they will be ejected, any metal materials, sorry, that they will be ejected by the eddy current. So the eddy current ejects non-ferrous, non-magnetic metals. Things fall into this conveyor belt, they receive a charge, then eddy current is here and that repels over the barrier there. So that's metals. So then ballistic separator, um, where we separate two-dimensional from three-dimensional materials. So you can see this angle here, the ballistic separator works. It almost reminds me of an elliptical, you know, at the gym that move like this, but they move very fast. So watch what happens. Two-dimensional items like this big plastic sheet and this paper, it gets walked up to the top and falls over. Three-dimensional, rounder, heavier items roll down. So we've separated the stuff that shouldn't be in the system from the valuable things that we do actually want. This is my favorite, this thing bouncing around here. It's a, a bag full of bags, probably. We get a lot of those. Yeah, we should not be getting any of those. So then for plastics, to sort plastics and cartons, we use optical scanners. These are like very fancy cameras using near infrared light. Materials fly by on the conveyor belt and pass under this line of light here. That is our optical scanner. So the near infrared scanner can tell what these materials are made of. It can tell what type of plastic it is. It can tell, you know, we can set it to look for color or, or no color. Uh, we can set it to look for a variety of qualities. So when it finds what it's looking for, it turns on a jet of air at the end of the conveyor belt that shoots that recyclable over a barrier onto another conveyor belt. So fancy cameras and air jets, sorting plastics and cartons. We have 16 of these at our facility, which is a lot. Remember, we are the largest MRF in the country. We have much to sort. Um, some smaller MRFs have none of these, and this is done by human hands. Um, some uh, MRFs might have one or two, but we, we have right with 16 of them, which is one reason we can say, hey, New Yorkers, put all rigid plastic in the bin. We can sort out the different types of plastic. We can sort out what's valuable from what's not. 
Um, so I will pause and take a couple of questions. What do I think about alternatives to single use plastic um, garbage bags for our recycling, like compostable plastic bags? So the last that I heard about compostable um, bags for actual recyclables, um, like for, for non-compostables or for trash, is that they're just not strong enough. And that might change. Um, they, they, you know, they might create a, a compostable plastic bag that's a bit sturdier and can hold materials, um, but they, what I know about them now is they just tend to rip a little more than um, than we need that kind of bag. We need it to be a bit sturdier, unfortunately. And even if a compostable bag comes to us at Sims, we're still going to have to sort it out from the mix. Um, it's not necessarily going to be any easier for us um, if it's compostable. And if it ends up in a landfill, I... I don't honestly know, but I, I do know that anything that breaks down like an organic in a landfill does emit methane. Uh, many, methane many landfills are capturing methane now uh, and using it as an energy source. More and more are starting to do that, but um, I'm all for innovation. We just have to know that you know innovation takes time to build out its, its full system. So compostable bags, cool, um, but I think they have a ways to go. Oh, this question is taking us back in time. I like that. I like history. Back in the 90s, oh, you worked at a, a paper mill in Spain for a summer. They used a lot of recycled content in their products. Great. And said the best quality recycled paper came from the U.S. because it didn't contained a higher portion of first use paper uh, than what they could get in Europe. Is that still the case? Ooh, I don't know for sure. I, I couldn't say for sure. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know, but that would be a cool question if you ever are able to tour Pratt, um, the paper mill. They do offer, when live tours are a thing again, um, Pratt Industry does offer live, live tours from time to time. They would be the ones to ask about that. Uh, right. Aluminum from Nespresso is probably not made from recycled aluminum. Interesting. I, I really, uh, I really wouldn't know. Um, if it is good, yes. Using recycled content is great. Um, Designing a product that is recyclable is cool, but that doesn't consistently lower its environmental impact. However, making a product that includes recycled content does consistently uh, lower in its environmental impact. Um, if not that it's important to know, aluminum has one of the highest uh, embodied energy in its manufacturing from raw material resources, very bad. Um, using uh, recycled pods or coffee another way. Yeah, th this is very true. And, and you know, this is something that concerns me when I see companies being like, oh, we're not gonna put our, our water in plastic anymore. We're gonna put it in aluminum. Ah! That has such a higher impact though. Um, you know, plastic is getting a lot of heat right now. Um, ocean waste is a big problem. It's a big thing. So that's understandable uh, and, and other reasons as well. But replacing plastic with glass and aluminum is not, not necessarily the answer because these items have can, can have actually a much higher environmental impact, even if they might be maybe easier to recycle in, in some ways, though that's not necessarily always true. Um, we can't necessarily replace one single use item with another single use item. I don't think that's gonna be the, the solution. Um, if this was a manual sorting facility, how many people would be needed to handle a thousand tons a day? Ah, that's another question I just don't know. Uh, but I can, I can say the, some facilities, um, humans will be the first line of defense in some facilities. In our, in our facility, humans are the last line of defense. And we have about 12 hand sorters um, during each shift. But I've seen videos of especially single stream MRFs, where remember paper is included in this mix, and they'll just have, you know, I've seen lines of conveyor belts, like three conveyor belts, each with five humans on each side. And that's just one room, just sorting paper. Um, so I, I could just make a number up and say maybe a hundred humans, um, but I couldn't say for sure. And I, I would say that number is going to look different depending on you know what's in the uh, material mix, you know what's in your waste stream, what are the capabilities of your technology and your actual facility um, as well. Yeah. Getting to that question about the buyers soon. I think that there is, a video of a hand sorter as well. This brave, brave gentleman. This is a very hard job. You have to be very focused for, for many hours a day, just removing anything that doesn't belong. So this is a stream of uh, number two plastic or HDPE 
color. Uh, over here is HDPE natural, same kind of plastic, but not dyed to color. So you have to remove anything that is not that type of material. And they'll have different bins, like you'll dump uh, metal in this bin or you'll dump waste in this bin. So some things will, will be recovered that are valuable. All right, and then once materials are sorted, they dump into one of our bunkers. It's like a holding space. When the bunker is full, its front door will open as you see here and the materials spill out. This is a bunker full of PET plastic, also known as number one plastic. So the materials spill out and then are fed into our baler. This is where we compress materials into bales. And that is what we make at our facility. We make bales. MRFs make bales. We do not clean materials at MRFs. We do not reprocess them into new products at MRFs. We receive them and sort them and bale them. And we're only bailing materials that have a strong end market. You know, generally recycling programs are only accepting items that have a strong end market. So these are uh, some of the plastics that we are sorting and bailing and selling. PET, again, number one plastic, soda bottles, water bottles. Polypropylene or number five plastic, that's yogurt cups to go containers, um, you know, usually like Gladware or any other Tupperware is usually polypropylene. HDPE natural, milk jugs, water jugs. HDPE color, laundry detergent, shampoo bottles, tin and aluminum. Um, so all of these materials we sell, they will go out on either rail cars or trucks and then be sold to a completely different company now. The materials leave SIMS to be reprocessed. So we are selling to companies I cannot give out their names because they're just not us. So they are their own entities and it is not our business to, to give out their names. Um, but we do sell to companies up and down the Eastern portion of the United States with a couple in um, Southeast Canada as well. A couple of our, our plastic commodities will go to, uh, to companies in Canada. Um, and you know, some sometimes may go as, as far south as Georgia once in a while or even and out to Pennsylvania um, or somewhere in between. But most of our bills will stay domestic. Oh, and let me go to what's next. So bills leave and are reprocessed. So if you remember in that pinwheel from the beginning, right, the, the reprocessor and then the brand owner or manufacturer. So plastic water bottles will go to a plastic reclaimer. They will shred the plastic up into flakes and wash it and remove contaminants like the labels. They will separate the cap from the bottle. They have the ability to do that. They will then pelletize the plastic and those pellets can be used to make maybe more water bottles, but more often they're used to make textiles like clothing or carpeting is a common uh, use for recycled PET in this country or in New York City specifically as well. So cartons, it's really the soft white paper that's inside the layers of plastic that will be used from the cartons. Often it is used to make toilet paper or sometimes writing paper. Can you provide a downloadable version of this presentation? Yes, Nick, my uh, Adobe PDF is, is on the fritz, but I'm working on getting that fixed and then I will, I will share a PDF with Caitlin, absolutely. Um, why not ship bales out by barge? So um, Beth, the two materials that we cannot bale um, glass and bulky metal will go outbound on barge. It, I think just our buyers don't have the capability to receive via barge. The, um, our tin can bales will go out on rail car and then those rail cars are barged across the bay, which that is not done very often anymore. Perhaps, perhaps you know that, um, but we're one of the only, if not the only company currently you know, barging rail, rail cars across the upper bay. Um, but our tin can bills will do that and then meet up with rail line again. But it really depends on who's buying the stuff and where they are. And if there's not a, a convenient you know, method for, for barging to them, we just can't do it. The city does barge a lot of its trash out now. You know, the city has four marine transfer stations for trash or refuse. Uh, and there's actually one very close to us that the Hamilton Avenue uh, Marine Transfer Station, the one close to us at Sims, where um, trash is barged out of the city. And then sometimes it might be loaded onto a rail car after, after the barge. 
but metal can be is smelted and can really be used to make you know any any a variety of metal products made of that same type of metal of course glass clear glass bottles and jars will generally be turned back into bottles and jars um, clear is going to go to a furnace and you know might be dyed a color or might remain clear but glass that's been dyed a color we don't have the capability right now in recycling to remove color from glass or from plastic so it, it's limits the potential of what it can become. Um, glass that's been dyed a color will probably be used for construction aggregate and plastic that's been dyed a color will probably all get mixed together to form a black plastic. All right, so this is the point I like to end on. Do feel free to send more questions and now I'll get to as many as I can. I talk about recycling in these tours. I get sometimes very excited and passionate. I am passionate about recycling. Recycling is good. Recycling is helpful. Please participate in your local recycling program. Recycle and recycle right. Just know recycling in itself is not a solution. It is a small piece of a much larger waste management pie. And the larger, more impactful pieces are reduction and reuse. These are not necessarily the norms for us for how we operate with materials, but I encourage you to consider these practices and how you can incorporate them into your lives. Um, reduce, reuse, recycle, that is the order of those R words. And those R words are more than just a cute song that we teach the kids, they're real practices that again, I, we all need to contemplate and, and incorporate. So if there are any last questions, I'd be happy to take them now. I'll just kind of wait and say nice things. Okay, the hand sorting sounds challenging. Yes, it is. If something is missed, which of course happens, um, how is it handled along the lines? So we are allowed a certain amount of contamination in our bales. Like generally it can vary from, you know, deal to deal, company to company, material to material, but generally about 5%, maybe lower, contamination is acceptable in the bales. When our bales go to the next step, uh, if you remember the, the reprocessors, many of them will do another quick sort. Like the plastic reclaimers, they might have another optical scanner at their facility, or they might have another hand sorting step at their facility, um, just to sort of, do, to kind of take care of, of that margin of error. Um, smelters, depending on the smelter, they might just throw everything in the furnace and just burn it all together, depending on how they operate. But yes, our, our ideal is to have our, our um, hand sorters really, really be on it. And we have some really lovely employees that, that are really on top of it, luckily. All right, so we'll say nice things for a moment in case anything else comes through. So I thank you so much for having me. I, I love you know sharing this information and just kind of revealing what's behind the recycling curtain. Um, I do very much hope you will stay informed about your local recycling program, wherever it may be, and that you will participate in it. And when in doubt, find out, you know, look it up. Um, feel free to email me as well. I am, I'm here, I'll pop my email up. Everyone, please stay safe um, and take care of yourselves out there. A couple more questions, that, which I will get to as well. Um, what exercises or rest practices are used to help the hand sorters? Oh, is there such a thing? You know, not that I know of, um, but that is something that I will recommend actually as a previous in my previous life yoga teacher um that that's really that's an excellent idea and I, I will ask about that there might actually be something that they do but I'm not aware of it um do you need to wash out every plastic food container and metal can Tatiana it is good practice to wash your recyclables um don't waste water uh, but in New York City they don't have to be perfectly clean some recycling programs might say, as a part of their literature, they might say, wash your recyclables, dry your recyclables. If your local program says that, do that. But in New York City, a little bit of food waste is, it's okay on the metal, glass, plastic, and cartons. Just don't go sending us like full containers because then it's just too heavy and we won't be able to sort it. So full, half full, a quarter full, we don't want that, please. Thank you all so much for your attention. Do feel free to reach out, follow us on social media. Stay in touch. Uh, thank you, Garrett, so much for, for presenting today. Looking forward to the day we can do it in person again. Amazing. Um, I just want to share, I know we just have a minute here. Um, oh, 
Can you see my slide there? Mm -hmm. uh, just the, we have a new Urban Green Live coming up um, in on March 23rd, that was just uh, published yesterday, rebooting the federal energy efficiency policy with uh, executive director of the ACEEE, Steve Nadell. So if you're interested in um, attending that, I encourage you to sign up at urbangreencouncil.org backslash urbangreenlive. If you're interested in other upcoming Urban Green events like the one today, you can go to urbangreencouncil.org backslash events and check out what else we have coming up. So that's it from me. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Everyone take care.